Hey everyone, God bless you. It's late on Holy Tuesday evening. We just finished praying the third and final bridegroom orthros, which is so profound, deeply moving, especially at the end of the Apostica when we, we sing the hymn of St. Cassiani, of the penitent woman on our knees. I'm recording this reflection. I hope it encourages you. I, I've been touched during these first uh, days of Holy Week, beginning Sunday evening with the first bridegroom service and then the pre-sanctified liturgies, Monday morning and Tuesday morning, the last one will be tomorrow. Uh, and then the bridegroom orthros Monday night and the last one today. I've been touched by the centrality of a focus on Jesus' teaching on the fig tree it finds itself uh, poignantly uh, in different services during these first three days of, of Holy Week. Anyone who is <coughs> even slightly familiar with Jesus's teaching knows how often he referred to the fig tree. In fact, the fig tree has multi a multiplicity of messages that I'd like to share with you. The fig tree is, a, a, scripturally speaking, a, a paradisal tree. Uh, the fig tree, in fact, is first mentioned because it was from the fig tree that the Lord God gathered leaves to make uh, clothing uh, for Adam and Eve. It also uh, features is featured in prophetic literature. So part of the promises of the covenant include that everyone would have uh, be able to be at peace sitting under his own fig tree. And some of the prophets used the barren fig tree, the fig tree that wasn't living up to its name and didn't have any fruit uh, as a uh, rebuke to believers, to the Israelites. Jeremiah did this in the eighth chapter of his prophecy. Micah did this in the seventh chapter of his prophecy. Uh, and it's probably, of course, from this inheritance that Jesus drew his um, use of the fig tree uh, in the Gospels. There are many messages, in fact, that come from uh, the fig tree. Jesus doesn't just teach one message. Uh, he teaches m many messages. In fact, he says in Luke chapter 21, uh, Behold uh, the fig tree and all the trees. And then he explains that when you see the fig tree blossom, when you see it uh, give its leaves, you know that summer is near. So here the fig tree is functioning as a eschatological signpost. Jesus says this just as he launches into his great eschatological discourse uh, about um, his uh, judgment that he's going to bring upon Judea how Jerusalem is going to be surrounded with Roman armies. The temple is going to be raised to the ground. The sign of the Son of Man is going to appear in the sky. Uh, he speaks of both of the judgment that is coming upon Jerusalem and also on the last day uh, and his return and the separation of uh, peoples at the judgment. So this is the first message uh, in Jesus' use of the fig tree, which is an eschatological signpost message. When you see these things, be careful, look up, open your eyes, recognize where you are and, and what's going on. He also uses the fig tree to describe the, the importance of fruit bearing, the importance of a sincere repentance and bearing fruits of that repentance. Remember that repentance isn't just a feeling. It's not just compunction or feeling sorry. Uh, those things are very important, of course, but repentance is measured like love is measured, not by feelings, but by deeds. This is why John the Baptist, uh, when so many were coming to be baptized in the Jordan River, and especially the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish leaders, whom he didn't trust and knew were hypocrites, uh, he said to them, uh, bring forth fruits in keeping with repentance and don't think that you can say to yourself, we have Abraham for our father. Your, your, your spiritual pedigree means nothing if you don't have repentance. And that, of course, doesn't just apply to the Jews. It applies to Christians. Uh, 
we Orthodox Christians can have the most magnificent patrimony. Uh, we can be descended from patriarchs. <laughs> I once was uh, serving the liturgy in the uh, Greek cathedral in Mexico City, and uh, one of the altar boys gave me a card saying that he was a direct descendant of the last Byzantine emperor. That may be, uh, but whatever our pedigree is, it means nothing if we don't have repentance and the fruits of repentance. John the Baptist said, the axe is laid at the root, at the root of the tree and every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the forerunner's curse of the tree. And it is a foreshadowing of Jesus's emphasis upon fruit bearing in his teaching about the, the fig tree. This can be found, for instance, in the 13th chapter of St. Luke's gospel. That is a very unusual chapter. In the first verses of that chapter, Jesus is teaching his disciples not to make judgments about people's spiritual condition uh, from their own uh, appraisal. For instance, some, um, some men had been killed by Pilate. And Jesus said to them, you don't think that those people were any worse than those who weren't killed, do you? And then he refers also to some men upon whom the tower of Siloam had fallen and killed them. And he said, you don't think that those people who suffered that terrible catastrophe were more sinners than those who were spared, do you? He said, unless you also repent, this must have been really shocking to his disciples for him to go from that discussion about uh, sinners and judgment to them. Jesus said, unless you repent, you all will perish. Wow. And then immediately after that discussion, which is in the first five verses of chapter 13, what do you know? Jesus teach, teaches with the parable of the fig tree that he went to and it had no fruits. And he looked at it and he said, may no fruit ever come from you again. The curse of the barren fig tree uh, that ultimately would be cut down because it didn't bear fruit is a, a frightening word against shallow religion and cheap repentance and uh, inauthentic, non-working faith, loveless faith. This is a second way that Jesus used the image of the fig tree. Mm. A third way was in, in his texts just after uh, his triumphal entry, just after the original Palm Sunday, uh, he immediately gave the, the, the teaching on the fruitless fig tree. This is probably why we find uh, so much emphasis in these first three days of Holy Week, uh, so much emphasis upon this teaching on the fig tree because it actually parallels. We've just celebrated Palm Sunday. After Palm Sunday is over, we begin Holy Week uh, Sunday night uh, and we hear this teaching from Jesus about the fig tree. That is parallel to actual historical occurrences. Jesus was received by the crowds led by the children. The masses proclaimed him the Messiah, sang Hosanna to him, accepted him as their king. But he knew in a very short time uh, that empty praise would be turned into blood curdling cries for his death. His death, be, his blood be on us and on our children would be the cries of so many Jews uh, who uh, initially hailed him uh, just a few days before, but would turn on him and call for his death, as sad as that is. It's in that context, just before he cleanses the temple, that Jesus uh, approaches the fig tree and curses the fig tree uh, as a symbol of the the worthlessness and the termination of Jewish religion uh, that was not accepting their Messiah and the fact that his judgment would now come. His judgment would now come. St. John Chrysostom commenting on this text says that Jesus cursed the fig tree so as to show the might of his vengeance um, on uh, and fulfilling all of the prophetic warnings of those who uh, tried to turn uh, God's people to faith and, and against whom they resisted. He then came into the temple precincts 
made a whip, uh, drove out uh, those who were buying and selling and perverting in terrible blasphemy the, the inner sanctum of the house of God into a place of money changing and immediately launched into his uh, warning uh, about what was coming, about what was coming. So this is a third use of the fig tree imagery by our Lord, and it's uh, very profound and very um, shaking. It makes your heart shake, doesn't it? It climaxes uh, in Matthew 21, where Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, speaking to uh, the Jewish nation. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. So there you have it. The, the fig tree without fruit is like a religion without godliness, like a person of faith without love, without good deeds. Uh, it's worthless. Uh, it doesn't bring salvation. And uh, this is the message of these days of Holy Week. This is why in the pre-sanctified uh, gospel reading on Monday, we heard about the fig tree. It's why the Synaxarian on Monday was about the fig tree. And it's why the hymnody and all of the bridegroom services reference uh, this fig tree. The emphasis is very much now for us, uh, for believers, to bear fruit, to bear fruit and to recognize that uh, God is calling us to a life of repentance and faith. May the salvation which is coming to us uh, through our Savior's cross and his resurrection, which we'll celebrate just in a few days, be dear to us, be dear to us, and inspire us to return a little love on our part for his great love so that we might bear fruit and truly sit under our own fig tree. God be with you for the rest of Holy Week and a most radiant Holy Pascha. Patristic Nectar Publications presents A Heart for God, lectures on the life of the Holy Prophet and King David. Christians are indebted to no one in the Old Testament more than the Holy Prophet and King, David. He alone, amongst all the believers in the ancient covenant, is described by the Lord as having a heart for God. David's sin, an infamy second only to that of Adam, has been meditated upon by believers, as has David's deep repentance, which has provided an image for countless penitents to imitate over the centuries in order to find peace with God. In these 10 lectures, Father Josiah surveys the entire life of King David, from his early rise as a humble shepherd, to his years in hiding from Saul, to the magnificent covenant that God cut with him 